In this tutorial, we're going to look at how organisms are adapted to living in extreme environments. The first aim is, can you describe how organisms are adapted to living in extreme temperature environments? Then can you explain how organisms have adapted to living deep down in the oceans near hydrothermal vents? And then finally, can you explain how life can sustain itself without energy from the sun? And what never ceases to amaze me about life is no matter how harsh the environmental conditions, it finds a way to thrive. I mean, take an environment like an arctic tundra or the desert. At first glance, they may seem as barren as the moon. Yet, if you take a deeper look, you'll find life everywhere, including bacteria buried in the snow. The ability for life to endure long, bleak, sub-zero winters or the torturous baking heat of the dry deserts is nothing short of remarkable. So sometimes adaptations are fairly obvious. For example, look at the spines on this plant here. These obviously reduce the chances of this plant being eaten and therefore help its survival. This frog's striking blue colour is a clear warning sign to other predators saying don't eat me because I contain a deadly poison. But sometimes animals adapt by being free riders, benefiting from others' genuine weaponry. Take for example this mountain king snake. It bears a striking resemblance to the coral snake, an incredibly venomous and lethal snake. However, the mountain king snake is non-venomous, completely harmless. It deters predators purely because it looks like a snake that is lethal. Finally, don't be fooled by this cute little thing down here. This is a slow loris, and you can think of it like the ninjas of the animal world. They are active at night, they are incredibly agile, and, as far as I know, they are the only poisonous mammal in the world. If you ever see a slow loris raising its arms, I would walk away. You see, underneath their arms, they exude a special chemical, which they start to lick, and when it reacts with their saliva, it activates a lethal poison, so when they bite, they kill. So let's start off by looking at how organisms are adapted to living in the desert. Now deserts are obviously very dry, they are incredibly hot during the day, and very cold at night. But if you're adapted to living in an environment like this, you can be sure there'll be less competition than in an area where conditions are more favourable. That's the advantage. So let's start by looking at the most famous desert dweller, the camel. The first most complex adaptation is the idea of having a large surface area to volume ratio. What that means essentially is the camel's very good at losing heat. And this is because if you compare the size of its volume, its three-dimensional mass, with its surface, you can see its surface is actually quite large, the area of the surface, relative to its mass. Having a large surface area means it's very easy for heat to escape from the volume inside. A great example of this is looking at something like an elephant. An elephant's body has a very low surface area to volume ratio. In other words, they've got this huge volume and relative to the surface area, the volume is much larger than the surface area. That means that it'd be harder for a hot elephant to lose that heat, as the heat has to travel through so many cells to get to the external environment. But if you look at an elephant's ears, very thin flaps of skin, huge surface area with almost no volume compared to the body. So elephants lose heat very rapidly through their ears. Secondly, it doesn't help a desert animal if it's very fatty, which would insulate a lot of body heat. Camels do have a lot of fat, but they store it in one place, which is their hump. This is basically so in times of food shortage, they can metabolize that fat and use it for energy. They also have a thin coat to allow heat to escape very quickly. So less insulation due to less body fat and a thin coat. Camels also conserve water by producing dark concentrated urine and they also sweat less. In addition to this, camels have long legs to keep their belly away from the baking sand and they have two eyelids, one which is see-through and one which is normal. This means during a sandstorm, they can close the see-through eyelid and protect their eyes from damage from the sand. I think you'd be pretty hard pushed to imagine a better adapted desert animal. Other animals, like this desert fox here or the fennix, um, they have sandy fur, and that's for camouflage, both for hunting and to avoid predators. But animals aren't the only organisms that inhabit a desert. There is plant life too. But before you make the mistake and assume all desert plants are cacti, the truth is there's actually only one desert in the world which contains cacti, and that's the Mojave Desert in America. However, there are many plants which could be mistaken for cacti in other deserts. 
So a cactus is adapted firstly by having a small surface area compared to its volume, so small surface area to volume ratio. This means it can conserve water. They also have thick stems for water storage, and there can be variation in the root network of desert plants. Some desert plants may have shallow and extensive roots, so roots which basically develop laterally. This is to make the most out of any little rainwater that falls. So you can see these droplets of rain have fallen and these shallow extensive roots can quickly absorb that water. Other desert plants have developed long deep roots to basically tap into water reserves deeper down in the earth. And that summarizes desert adaptations. Now if you look at the other extreme, Arctic adaptations, here organisms need to conserve body heat. So they have a small surface area in relation to the size of their volume. Right, look at this seal. In fact, lots of desert animals are just basically large, round shapes. Huge volume, relatively low surface area. They have a special type of fat called blubber, which provides excellent insulation. Blubber can also be metabolized, in other words, broken down, for times when there are food shortages. So it acts as a wonderful energy store. Many Arctic dwellers are white-furred. Obviously, that acts as excellent camouflage, whether you're a hunter like the polar bear or prey escaping a polar bear. You also notice that many Arctic animals have very small ears. This acts again as a low surface area to volume ratio to reduce heat loss. Whereas many desert animals have ears with a huge surface area to volume ratio so they can lose heat rapidly. Also, many Arctic animals have broad feet. This allows them to spread their body pressure over a greater surface area, so it reduces the force on the snow and ice, making it less likely for them to fall or get stuck. Many Arctic animals also have greasy fur. This means if they get wet after swimming, the water literally sheds off, so it reduces heat loss through evaporation. You know, imagine splashing water in your face and going running around the Arctic. Your face would freeze. If you had very greasy skin, that water would drip off and that would avoid that freezing sensation. So that is how you can describe how organisms are adapted to living in extreme temperature environments. Now I think it's fair to say that the sun is the starting point of almost every food chain on our planet. The sun emits energy in the form of light and heat. Plants make use of that light energy by carrying out photosynthesis and converting that energy into sugars. Primary consumers such as this rabbit will then feed on those plants to obtain that energy. And secondary consumers, such as this eagle, will consume the primary consumers for that energy. But amazingly, not all food chains are like this. And this is a relatively recent discovery that life can exist without the sun's energy. To do this, we're going to have to venture down to the depths of the ocean. So I'm just going to take my submersible here. Deeper than 500 meters. Deeper than 1,000 meters. And we keep going down. 1,500 meters. 2,000 meters, that's two kilometers down. And now we're approaching our destination at 2,500 meters below the surface of the ocean. Here you'll find some of the strangest, alien-like, otherworldly creatures you can imagine. Here some creatures emit their own light through bioluminescence. Many organisms down here have large eyes to make use of the little light being emitted by these bioluminescent creatures. As many of these organisms are literally swimming in the dark, they have large mouths which they keep open most of the time to scoop up any particles of food that come their way. Many can also have long feelers to feel their way around rather than see their way around. So that is how you can explain how organisms have adapted to living deep down in the oceans near hydrothermal vents. So our submersible has now reached its destination on the seabed. So let's have a look what exists down here. Deep down here, we find weaknesses in the Earth's crust, exposing it to the mantle beneath. And outlets for the mantle include these hydrothermal vents, these underground volcanoes, which spew out a mineral-rich soup of chemicals. Particularly chemicals rich in sulfur and iron. We call them sulfides. So down here, we have extreme pressure. We have no sunlight and extreme temperature changes, incredibly hot around the hydrothermal vents and very cold away from hydrothermal vent. It's these sulfur-rich chemicals that are the key to understanding how life can survive without sunlight. So food chains down here start with, rather than plants as the producer, chemosynthetic bacteria as the producer. In other words, chemical synthesizing bacteria. 
What these remarkable autotrophic bacteria can do is convert the chemical soup here of iron sulfides or sulfides into organic molecules. You can just think of that as food. Now these bacteria found a home in another species called the giant tube worm. These look like three meter tall tubes of lipstick. And this is a wonderful example of mutualism where two organisms help each other out. The bacteria provide food in the form of organic molecules for the giant tube worm, as well as for themselves, of course. And in return, the giant tube worms provide the bacteria with a home in the form of shelter. So the producers in this food chain are the chemosynthetic bacteria. The primary consumers are the giant tube worms. And then the food chain becomes more recognisable. The secondary consumer is a crab, for example, and the tertiary consumer is an octopus which feeds off the crab. So that is how life can sustain itself without energy from sunlight. Remember this food chain, as you may need to recall it for a six-mark question at the end of an exam. Also, it's important to remember that this is one example of mutualism. One other thing, bacteria that can withstand such high extreme temperatures are known as extremophiles. As file means like and extreme, referring to extreme conditions, extremophiles. And that is how you explain how life can sustain itself without energy from the sun.